Hello, and welcome to the RIBA Journal Annual PIP Architecture for Health and Wellbeing webinar. On this beautiful day and the summer sol solstice, um, of course, the longest day of the year, so we've got a few great things to celebrate. Um, we are so delighted to have so many of you joining us today for this fabulous webinar. Um, the World Health Organization defines positive mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her own community. So for today's RIBA PRP, we are going to be welcoming architects, writers, and thinkers, showcasing diverse projects from across the UK that enables connections, contributions to the community, improving health and well-being of their users. So firstly, uh, we couldn't have these webinars without our sponsors to provide these free to attend sessions. Um, so we'd like to thank our sponsors today, which is Amptico and Rockwell. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Christopher Adelaide. I am the director of um, Christopher Adelaide Architecture, or also known as KAA. Um, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Um, I set up KA in 2017, uh, and me and my team, we've designed and delivered schemes between 9 and 16 units or homes. Um, and we are very lucky that um, I got a chance to present one of our projects, Mount Batten Court, which is also known as St. Mary's Muse, to this exact PIP, but for the residential buildings in early 2021. And I think it was a testimony to the power of the use of technology that we have you, the amazing audience today, to see our project. Um, and it, you know, it had a greater reach to the rest of the world um, where these webinars go further, even beyond the UK, beyond our shores. Um, and of course, some great news happened just this week. We found out that our Mountbatten Court project has been put up for the prestigious shortlisted um, for the Brick Award or the Brick Association Award. Um, against some great competition for the UK. So if you like to see that, just hop over to our practice website, www.ka-a.co.uk to see some of the things we do. Um, our practice also has a passion for offsite construction, um, and we're looking into designing of some vol volumetric offsite terrace housing that we've coined the Afro House or the AFRO House architecture for the reasonably ordinary house. Um, and this is proposed at uh, uh, currently at a uh, concept stage, but we hope someday to get a prototype built and you'll see mini Afros everywhere. Anyway, uh, this webinar is not about me. So it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Ben Shannon. Ben is an architect, author, TEDx speaker, and mental well-being advocate, as well as being the director of his company, Exist. Um, a well-being consult uh, consultancy that helps clients and design teams to create healthier places. Ben is an RIBA author, and we are delighted today to say that we're going to share in the link um, a 20% discount on his book, which can be purchased at the RIBA bookstore. Um, and it's called the design, uh, sorry, the Happy Design Toolkit Architecture for Better Mental Well-Being. So Ben, thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, so without further ado, Ben. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christopher. Let me share my screen. And I'm hoping everybody can see that. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Firstly, Christopher, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Great to hear about you and your practice too. Uh, and thank you so much to uh, the RBA, to Reba Journal and all our sponsors for uh, asking me to talk today. Um, what a privilege. Uh, so yes, I'm really excited to talk to you all today about, um, as Christopher said, how we can think more about mental well-being, and that's obviously a big part of what I do, and as you'll see, it's a big part of my backstory, um, and that's what led to me writing my two books. Uh, so you're probably sat there thinking, I've never heard of this bloke before, who is he, what does he do, and why should we be listening to him? So um, I, I did, I trained as an architect um, at Cardiff and Westminster universities, and I did work as an architect primarily on large residential projects for around um, 10 years. Um, but during that time, I actually went through my own uh, issues with my mental health, um, particularly sort of in, in my mid twenties, really just burned myself out through overwork uh, and um, gave myself problems with anxiety and kind of low level depression. 
so having gone through that firsthand, um, that, that really is what sent me down this path. And I became a really strong advocate for better mental health in architecture um, and, and really just trying to encourage architects to talk about their mental health too. And it was something that I think we've all got better at, but certainly 10 years ago, uh, we, we probably, myself included, weren't really doing enough. Uh, so great to see the progress we've made over the last 10 years or so. Um, but it also led me to think about uh, the, the buildings that I was designing and the ways in which they affected people's mental health. Uh, and I started researching this and, and found a lot out from environmental psychology and from neuroscience. Um, but it was things that I was never really taught at university as an architect. So I started collating these into a bit of a design guide and it kind of snowballed. And eventually I ended up writing Happy by Design. Uh, which came out, I believe, in 2018. And that was really me trying to get my head around the concepts and trying to understand all of those decisions that we make as architects. What are the actual scientific psychological impacts that they have on people? And as a result of that, uh, I kind of got more and more excited by the subject, more and more interested, looked into the well building standard and, and various um, standards like that and started researching the, the more broad topic of healthy buildings in general, and trying to understand how every decision we make as an architect affects physical health too. So uh, that can be everything from, you know, the, the impact that our material choices have on air quality um, or even the way that we lay out buildings. How does that affect how, how much people move, how active people are or how social people are and how much they interact with one another. So all of these really important factors that are shown to have a significant impact on people's health. Uh, and the next question you might be wondering is, well, why, why is this important? Um, uh, if you, you like me, probably a few years ago before I became interested in this topic, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't really think I needed to be considering mental health that much when designing buildings. I thought, well, I know good design principles. I've been taught good design principles and been putting them into practice over many years, I, I hope. But why is it important? Well, the first point here is that we know mental health crises are really common across a huge, pretty, pretty much all um, population groups. doesn't matter what age you are, what ethnicity you are, what gender you are. Um, chances are, you know, that we're seeing high rates of mental health problems across all of the, uh, you know, all different groups. So it's really important as a society that we do try and make positive changes here. And as architects, we definitely have the power to do that. Now, as I said, from environmental psychology is pretty much just entirely the study of um, how the world around us affects how we feel, how we think, how we behave. And so we absolutely do know that the world around us can impact all of those things. It can have a huge effect on our mood and, and on our behavior and well-being. And uh, the reason I've included um, the, uh, the graph on the left there is that um, effectively we, we kind of all sit on, on uh, this sort of graph where um, on any given day, um, we can have uh, really, really good mental health and really bad mental health. It can, it can depend on what's happened to us that day, that week, that month or year. Um, and we, you know, it, it is arranged um, like that. So you're much more likely to be sat somewhere between sort of 40 and 60 if we're scoring from zero to 100. But the important thing to know is that the things that happen to us every day can shift us up or down that chart. And, and one, of the, um, one of the things that can affect that is obviously the world around us. So I'm a really strong believer that yes, we're not going to necessarily cure significant, serious mental health problems through our buildings, through our designs alone. But what we can do is just shift everybody a few points along that chart and, you know, take someone who's on a 35, maybe take them up to a 38 or a 40. And if we can do that across the whole population, then the impacts on, on our country and the world's mental health could be enormous. So in practice, what does it look like to design healthy buildings and, and design uh, mentally healthy buildings too? The first thing to say is it's about exceeding industry minimums. And uh, I, I think um, architects, from my experience, are generally very aware of this, that, you know, the building regs, they're a minimum, and we should be aspiring to do much, much bigger and better things than just meet the building regs. But often, uh, depending on who you work for, and particularly with commercial clients, they see the building regs or the London plan or the national space standards as, OK, well, that's that's actually our target. You know, as long as we're hitting those, then we're providing healthy buildings. Unfortunately, that's that's not the case, and and best practice is actually a long way above building regs, and that's that's the first thing I think we we all need to be um, sort of trying to push that message. Secondly, it's really about taking that person first approach, and I was very lucky. The architecture schools I went to were really focused on start with the person, think about their routine, their lives, their activity, and, and design outwards rather than start with this big. Uh, object and, and and design inwards and we can think about the internal spaces at the end uh, so um, 
it's really, you know, taking that person first approach is absolutely vital. It's perfect. And I think that's the approach the majority of architects do take today, which is really positive. Um, but finally, it's it's also a it's a byword for design quality. And that, that's something I'll come on to talk about later. But effectively, we as architects, we all know how to design great buildings. And, and uh, there's, you know, I'm a, I'm a real believer that every architect out there is um, got into this subject because they're passionate to make change, they want to design great buildings, and really how I see this is actually just strengthening and supporting that case to help architects design, uh, you know, better, healthier buildings that help people to thrive, and hopefully that's where we, we end up stepping in, supporting and championing better architecture, helping architects fight their corner when things are maybe trying to get value engineered out. Uh, so, that, that's exactly my point there is that we we really can come in and use data to support good design and, and i think that's the important thing here it's not about coming in and saying architects don't know what they're doing because absolutely architects do know what they're doing and are as i said doing amazing things but it's so important for example um if we look at awe and and beauty you might think they're fairly intangible things and we can't really measure them but what, what actually we we know for example is that when people experience or you know if they look up at yosemite or if they walk into uh, an amazing cathedral um actually that sense of awe has been shown to stay with people and have an impact on stress levels and quality of life and happiness for up to a week so there's a really good case there for actually yes we do need that double height lobby sorry client um i know you might want to value engineer it out but actually it's going to have a really big impact on the people using this building every day similarly with materials we know that if we're using natural materials um that for example timber there's lots of research around the impact of timber and we know that it actually has a physiological impact on people it activates something called our parasympathetic nervous system which slows down our heart rate it makes us calmer more relaxed and effectively helps people to perform better so again there's a really strong argument to be made there if you're trying to provide a nice bit of uh, sort of timber internal finish and your client wants to strip it out and replace it with plasterboard because it's cheaper you've got a really strong bit of evidence and data there to support them not doing that uh, and similarly, if we're, if we're looking at uh, even things like space, so if we're looking at ceiling heights, for example, we know from research in prisons that when you have lower ceilings, you tend to get uh, higher rates of violence and prison incidents. So actually, it's really important that we do have, you know, these nice uh, tall spaces, a sense of space, a sense of personal space as well, um, as probably we, a lot of us found during lockdown, if you were anything like me, stuck in a really small flat um that, that feeling of not having personal space is very constricting and we know that it, it does affect aggression levels in people so again a really good case to be made there um, that we can back up with science and data so in terms of some of the key areas that we really could be thinking about again as i said these just really do link back to uh just good design, um, good understanding of architecture and interior design. Um, but these were, are really the areas where we can find very strong data to support our case. And um, these formed the uh, seven chapters of my book. And I'll quickly run through those now, um, just very light touch. But firstly, thinking about daylight, it's uh, one of the most important, obviously one of the building blocks of architecture and many architects over the years have come out with many quotes about, you know, light is a building material in itself. Um, we, we create form and, and space with light and this is absolutely right. But one of the reasons in terms of science that it's so important is that it has a huge impact on our circadian rhythms, which is effectively uh, our internal body clock that doesn't just tell us when to wake up and go to sleep. It gives our body cues for all kinds of things like when we should be going to the toilet, when we should be eating. Um, so uh, e even sort of hormone release as well. So actually, if we don't get enough access to daylight, for example, if we're putting um, office workers in a basement space, um, this has a really significant impact on, on people's uh, health and their sleep patterns. So we know, for example, when, when office workers do work in a basement in com comparison to a space that received natural light, some studies show them having up to 46 minutes less sleep per night, which if you take that over a week or a year is just an enormous sleep deficit. We can counteract that with, with artificial light, things like circadian lighting, which can help to mimic the sun's movement, but obviously we'd always prefer natural lighting. But those options are there now and the, the technology is getting better and better all the time. And it's also really important that we just think about simple things with, with uh, artificial lighting, like color temperature and glare, um, those sorts of things that again can have a real impact on how people feel in a space. Comfort and materials, really important, and probably could have had a chapter each, um, but uh, they are very inherently linked, uh, as, as you know, but this is everything from providing healthy building materials that are low in VOCs. So a lot of building materials 
that we may, may think are quite healthy. Um, and we're seeing a lot of these now, particularly things like recycled rubber um, or recycled sea plastics. We might think they're healthy, but perhaps they're giving off nasty, volatile organic compounds into the air, um, which can uh, be harmful for people, or they might contain lots of microplastics. So yes, they've got good eco-credentials, but potentially not good health credentials. And then of course, in terms of comfort, we're, we've got to think of everything from acoustic comfort um, to thermal comfort and even sort of psychological comfort, sense of safety, sense of space, as, as we've already touched upon. But we know that all of these things can have a, a massive impact. Um, for example, noise, uh, noise pollution is uh, on the World Health Organization's sort of worry list, things they're really concerned about worldwide um, because it's closely linked to uh, heart attacks, and heart disease um, because of the increased stress that it causes. Uh, in terms of control and autonomy, this is really about enabling people to live their lives in the best way. And again, research really strongly supports this. We know that um, when people are shown to have a greater sense of control, then actually they feel happier, they report better well-being scores, um, really all to do with that idea that it, it's, it's fundamental to us to, to have that sense of control. It, control, as you know, is linked so closely to lots of mental health issues. If we look at, say, eating disorders, really serious mental health issue, that's all really about control. Um, so if we can give people greater autonomy through our designs, whether that is uh, giving them a place to work, but then also allowing it to hide away at the end of the day, or on the end there, giving people greater storage, which we know sort of clutter is linked to cortisol and stress. So giving people better storage, the ability to control their space and their belongings, uh, these are all going to be really positive moves for people. We, we know as well that nature, and I'm sure you, you've all read plenty about biophilia, so I won't harp on about it too much, but again, this is so easily demonstrable with, with scientific evidence. Uh, everything from growing food, which is now actually used as horticultural therapy by many mental health charities, right through to even views of nature that have been shown, even watching a nature documentary has been shown to relax us and make us feel more positive, but certainly views of nature um, should be embraced. Even views onto internal plants, internal green walls or water features can, can all be really powerful too. There's lots of research behind all of those. And in the middle image there, um, that Thomas Heatherwick Maggie Center, um, we know that curved forms and curved shapes can actually have a um, really positive impact on people too, in the sense that um, we're naturally drawn to them. And there's various theories for this, but if we look at uh, children and infants, um, eye tracking studies even, they are more drawn to curved organic forms than they are to angular or rectilinear ones. So um, again, ab absolutely fascinating. It doesn't mean we have to do our entire building as big sweeping curves that then become difficult to inhabit. But like in the Heatherwick example, they're just some gentle curving structure at the top of the space, just really softens the, the whole form. Aesthetics and legibility, again, it's, I could probably do a, a full session on each of these topics, but it's, it's obviously a controversial one because everyone has their own views and opinions on, uh, on, on aesthetics. So I, I won't get involved in, in style or taste or any of that sort of side of things. Um, but really there are some kind of fundamental rules that we, we can all learn and, and understand you know, legibility for that example, that, that image on the left there, um, the, the evidence, the jury's still out on color and whether actual specific colors elicit a physiological response, uh, that can be sort of, uh, continuous across, um, people of all backgrounds. Um, it tends to, from, from what I've read, tends to be more cultural and depends on where you were brought up, but we certainly can use color as a very powerful tool to create joy or to create better legibility, like in this project where, um, you can really navigate a, a complex space through the use of color and, and things like that. So that's a very powerful way to do that. We can also think about, you know, doing that in different floors of an apartment building or a hotel. We can think about even doing it in car parks and places like that to, to color code any spaces that can tr traditionally be quite confusing or illegible. Um, the the central, central image there is thinking about the sort of quality of an aesthetic, making sure that we don't necessarily have to have lots of detail, lots of ornate stuff, but it's vital that we do have a sense of design quality. And this is really closely linked to the idea, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and those, those higher points there about self-actualization, sense of self-worth. And if we design or construct buildings that are poor quality, that don't age well, um, that aren't cared for, the message that's sending to the people living in that building or in that neighborhood is that they're not really cared for. And, and subliminally, that's, that's gonna kind of have, have a quite significant impact on, on people in, in that location. And then that final image is uh, looking at pitched roofs. And there's a great book by Lily Bernheimer that I'd recommend to all of you called The Shaping of Us, if you're interested in this topic. She talks about this idea of uh, our, our psychological associations with certain forms. And 
For example, we, we tend to, uh, she says, as a species we, or as a society, we tend to find pitch roofs comforting. They, they suggest home to us. They suggest a sense of safety and protection from the elements. So again, understanding the psychological impact of the choice of forms that you're making can, can also be really, really important. And we, we do have the evidence to back those things up as well. Uh, activity and movement, as I mentioned at the start, this is something that we have a really strong ability to impact as designers. The way that we lay out our buildings and our communities and streets and cities um, can really affect whether people walk a lot or, or are more active. And you only have to look at a city like LA, uh, where it's very car dominated because of the, the urban planning that happened there, um, makes it really, really challenging for people to really walk that much, make it all cycle. So um, we, we do have to consider these things across all scales. And of course, it's all well and good. You know, that image on the left there is about, yes, let's provide cycle parking. That's fantastic. But if we're going to do that, we also actually need to provide a whole sort of swathe of other um, facilities. We need to provide really good changing rooms. We need to provide a generous quantity of showers, not just one shower for an office of 100 people. And we need to provide lots of lockers too, because if we don't provide all of these, then no one's going to want to cycle into work and be sat there in their sweaty clothes all day. So it's about thinking about that bigger picture and that, that full journey from um, leaving the home to actually sitting down at your desk and starting work. Similarly, in that central image, uh, we, we know that it's, it's quite difficult to get people to take the stairs instead of the lift. Um, people generally, uh, we, you know, we, we all evolved to conserve energy. And so we need to give people nudges and think about nudge psychology to make people a bit more active. And I um, love this staircase by Buckley Gray Yeoman, where the stairs, it brings in lots of other ideas that we've, we, we look at in the book. So it's got natural materials, it's got, well, it's got plants, it's got natural lights, it's got splashes of colour, there's the opportunity for social interaction. So actually, let's, let's turn a staircase into a special moment and encourage people to use that rather than take the elevator. Um, and then finally, this idea of curiosity in the final image. Again, a sort of a Lily Bernheimer concept, but can we encourage people to wander? We, as a species, we like to explore, we like to be curious. Of course, we need to think about safety too and, and overlooking and surveillance and adequate lighting. But can we design cities that encourage a bit of curiosity and um, make people kind of want to turn that next corner and, and walk a little bit further? And then the final chapter of the book looks at social interaction, which again is something that is incredibly important for our mental health. Uh, in terms of mortality rates, being chronically lonely is actually, uh, it's been shown to be as bad for you as being obese or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So the health impacts can be enormous. Um, we know that when people are lonely, their diet starts to deteriorate and mental function starts to deteriorate quite quickly. So really, really key that we as designers um, communicate that message to our client and, and to our clients and push this notion that our buildings should be highly social places. Um, and this, you know, this can be thinking about everything from facilities for children right through to how we design furniture uh, and making sure that actually you know, that, that bench in the centre there could easily all just be everyone be facing in the same direction and not encourage social interaction at all. But because of the form and the design and the shape, it's actually encouraging people to face towards each other and have those chance interactions. And similarly, uh, that final image on, on the right there, um, it's a later living scheme by Russell Curtis's practice. And uh, that's really, again, I love the way that they've put in these little chatting nooks. So trying to encourage those chance interactions, an opportunity for people to just stop and speak to their neighbours, maybe sit and have a coffee and a catch up, game of chess or game of cards or something, rather than the alternative, which could be burying that circulation space in the middle of a building with no natural light and people don't really stop and chat there. So in terms of just some quick final thoughts, we... As architects, you know, we have the power to really affect people's lives and both for the, for the better or for the worse. And we can really create quite negative, unpleasant places. And we've all seen them over the years. Um, hopefully we're, we're moving, moving away from that now and we're, we're, all, we're designing better places and building better places. But um, by using data, by understanding the science behind our design decisions, we can uh, not only make better decisions, but then we can back those decisions up when we're questioned by a client or by a quantity surveyor. Um, we, we can have a really strong case behind us um, to fight our corner. And ultimately, we can use it to challenge value engineering and champion places that are better for everybody. Thank you very much. Oops, hi there. We seem to have lost Christopher. Ah, no, I'm back. Your back. Hello. Technology, eh? <laughs> Thanks so much, Ben. That was uh, really, really interesting. And actually, 
Um, some of those thoughts, of course, when we've been living the last two years, it's been quite important to kind of reflect on how buildings are built. Um, I wanted to firstly, whilst you were speaking, welcome some of the people who are not in the UK. We've got lots of people in the UK. But we also have audiences from Spain, Fiji, uh, Tunisia, and also Mali. So my first question to you would be, would your book, how would your book work within other parts of the world? Is that something you've been thinking about? And is there a series of these books coming out soon? Well, I, uh, the first thing I'd say is that really it's trying to understand the general human condition, I suppose. And uh, yes, of course, we are all diverse and different. We all have different needs. And particularly when we start to think about neurodiversity, it, it becomes difficult because we might have to sometimes make decisions that um, uh, say we know something might be better for the general mental well-being of the population but actually it might be really difficult for a person of certain neurodiversity so it does bring up lots of challenging questions but yeah ultimately um, these these design rules you know we are all sort of 99.99 percent uh, identical in terms of we're all carbon-based life, life forms we will have almost identical DNA um, I mean I think we're something like Two thirds genetically identical to bananas, so it's you know you, it's uh, we, we're all very closely related, and we we do all like the same and need the same things. We all need daylight. Um, we all need access to nature, um, and we, we all need exercise and movement. So, and, and social interaction. The, these rules aren't just for for British people or for European people, but they they do apply worldwide. As I said, things like colour are really interesting because um, we know that culturally. For example, people from China may see red as a really positive color of celebration, but people from certain parts of Africa may, may see it more as a color associated with mourning. So uh, that's why I've, I've deliberately stayed away from those sort of um, rules and, and really tried to stick to things that we know are more universally applicable across the human humans as, as a rule. Oh, excellent, excellent answer. And um, we've got a question uh, from Ben from FCR. Um, and I guess this this also leads to something I've written down whilst you were speaking about kind of data led methods. And his question is, please, could we have a reference about the one week effect of or stress reductions, etc., that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk? Yeah, this is going to sound like a real plug for my book and it isn't meant to be. I can't I can't remember off the top of my head uh, where that study has come from, but it is referenced in the book. So um, if yeah, everything I mentioned uh, in this talk is, is referenced in the book. Um, so apologies that I don't have that reference to hand. Uh, but yes, I in terms of the research, um, it's it's pretty much the vast majority of the research in the book. There's a there's a very big section at the end of all of the references and, and resources that I used. It tends to be generally scientific studies, often from environmental psychology. Um, but yeah, apologies that I don't have that to my, at my fingertips. Not, not a problem. I guess that's a good uh, system to purchase your book. So <laughs> that uh, wasn't my intention, sorry. Uh, of course, no, of course, everyone, you know, needs to learn some of these things. And you've got, you basically got all the bits from everywhere that's happening at the moment. So I guess people can, contact you if they've got any further questions. But we have one more um, just before we move to our next speaker. And it's from Justin where, uh, sorry, Justin, who says, where do you get the data to challenging value engineering? Another hard question, I guess. Where do you get the data? Well, that, that's the thing. I, th I think it's about understanding what you're trying to fight for. So say we were trying to fight for bigger windows and the client wanted to value engineer them out. Um, we, we, it would really be a case then of diving into the research about daylight and the impact that daylight can have on people. Um, so, you know, again, going back to the, the things of circadian rhythm, I, I read a research report into value out of daylight recently, which it was looking in, uh, I believe it was in Manhattan and saying that they were getting about a 7% value add um, in offices that receive generous natural daylight. So again, presenting those sorts of figures about the financial side of things can be hugely powerful because you can start to talk to your clients about return on investment and say, yes, you might be increasing your bill cost by 0.5% across the whole building by increasing this glazing size, but potential returns could be huge. So um, yeah, it's, it's worth digging into that side of things too. It's a long-term value, isn't it? Of the Absolutely. Lasting, you know, I'm sitting in a home 1930s and it's still standing and I exactly. still love that building type and it's got a pitch roof. Um, thank you very much, Ben. Um, we're going to we're going to move on um, and uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, and of course, um, we'd like to uh, introduce um, Sophie Wise, um, who is one of the sponsors from Amtico. Hi, Sophie. How are you? Morning, Christoph. Yeah, really well, thanks. How are you? I'm not bad. I'm just going to 
introduce you with uh, you know some of, of what you do. Um, so you're the regional commercial manager for Amtico, uh, and you're going to discuss the importance of surface finishes in specifications uh, and many more speciality things like flooring. Um, and we're going to put a link in the chat of um, what you you do and where you come from. Um, you have a love for interior finishes, uh, and you're happiest when you're designing. Um, and doing specifications with architects and interior designers alike, I guess, um, or even other clients. Um, so you've been with Amco for four years um, and you look after a team of eight um, and you specialize in projects over the UK and Ireland and you've got 20 years of sales experience. So I'm going to pass it over to you because I think you'll explain yourself a lot better than myself um, and, and let us know what you're going to present today. OK, lovely. Let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yep. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll presume that's a yes. Okay, yes. Good morning everyone. Yeah, my name is Sophia Wise. I'm from Amtico. I've had that lovely introduction, so I won't need to uh expand on that. Um I'll go into a little bit about how we can um, help our architects, designers and specifiers on this call today a, a little bit later. Um, I just wanted to introduce Amtico. For those of you that are not familiar with us, uh, we are a designer and manufacturer of luxury vinyl tile flooring or LVT for short. Um, we've been supplying floors globally from our Coventry factory here in the UK. and. Um, uh, I found Ben's conversation uh, talk really, really interesting because he expanded on a lot of um, subjects about considered design today in terms of health and well-being. So hopefully um, what I'm going to talk to you guys today about is just a, an expansion of that and looking at towards how surface finishes can affect um, health and well-being. So why do we believe they're so important? Um, I think surface decoration can often be described as soft, or nice to have, but actually in reality, the combination of colours and patterns and surface textures alongside lighting can really make or break um, a scheme. And these finishing touches can really help illustrate a design and form an integral part of answering the brief. So let's start with some colour. Um, we're all familiar with the basic concepts of colour psychology. You've got blues um, and greens for calming effects and environments. You use vibrant shades for encouraging energy and so on. But it actually goes much further than that. And that's before we even really get to the practical considerations of like reflective values and the Equality Act. How can we influence mood with colour? I think the environment and the function of the space will determine this. So how the user interacts with their surroundings is based on what is represented to them. So uh, I was just going to take you through a couple of slides that show you some recent projects that we've done um, that look at how mood and colour are, are linked. So on the left hand side, we've got a medical centre in Germany. It's a rehabilitation centre. Uh, previously, you know, that this, this idea of using any calming colours, um, they've kind of gone against the grain here with using that bright blue. But the brief to us was about creating a road to recovery. Um, so I think it's really worked in this in this instance. And then on the right hand side, uh, this is one of our care homes uh, that we work with, uh, Barchester Care, a national care home group in the UK. And they're all about um, creating a very high end luxury um, homely feel. When you move into sort of bigger spaces like public buildings, offices, education cent centres, you've got areas that are much bigger and have to serve a a multi-purpose. Um, so we have to then look at where we use these colours and perhaps looking at sectioning off areas so that you've got, you know, maybe uplifting, inspiring colour combinations in one area and then sort of gentler, quieter tones in others. And then thinking about colour in a sort of hospitality environment, um, I think we would probably all agree that when we're in these environments, we're looking for a little bit of escapism. We're, we're looking for something that might be engaging and stimulating, but something that's very different to what our, our own home would be like. And colour can play a really important part in that. Um, but it isn't just an aesthetic. Uh, when we look at it with lighting and the conjunction of that, we look at how the practic 
practically that can improve the well-being. So with offices, um, and I know Ben touched on this, um, it's all about providing as much natural light uh, as possible. But also with um, flooring, we're often asked to kind of really think about how we can clarify and focus certain areas within an office. Um, we know that studies have seen a drop in productivity when you've got poorly lit lighting um, or a loud looking or sounding environment. And also within hospitality, we see a shift to the other end where it's all about um, a softer, more muted tones to help promote that good night's sleep. And then back to healthcare, um, we know that there's sort of numerous studies that have shown that actually poorly designed and lit healthcare environments can actually increase um, a patient's recovery times. And moving towards sort of certain um, groups such as dementia sufferers, we know that actually certain colours cause stress and anxiety. Um, so we look at trying to support all of our architects and designers in helping them choose the right colours um, and tones for a, for a project, especially with their flooring. Um, not having the right contrast, contrast of colours can leave you in breach of the Equality Act. Um, but a sort of quick plug from me, we do actually offer REBA accredited CPDs on designing with dementia and um, LRB. So if you guys would like to know more, then please do get in touch. Uh, moving on to pattern um, and how we use pattern positively. Um, again, it's a, it's a really important um, consideration in terms of promoting health and well-being. Um, we know that color and pattern go hand in hand and pattern can be anything uh, simple and subtle, or it can be really bold and complicated depending on the requirements of the scheme. And people often associate some patterns with specific environments. So just again, to give you a few examples, um, we see a lot of um, uh, use of sort of like a homely feel of woods, the traditional patterns based on these like parquetry, and they're often used in sort of residential and care environments just to give that reassuring homely feel. Um, and likewise, in sort of where, where we've got large areas, um, we often look at supporting our uh, specifiers by suggesting um, a large oversized pattern, but maybe with a subtle stone. And again, that just creates a sort of um, calming effect after a busy day. And then I guess this is the most important um, way that sort of pattern can, can affect well-being because it's, it definitely acts as a, as a form of um, wayfinding and this has always been an important consideration but in the last couple of years for through the pandemic we have seen so many of our specifiers um, you know looking to use flooring as a wayfinding tool because it just gives that person reassurance without having to ask somebody that they can navigate their way around say a hospital a department or, or a university space without feeling overwhelmed and this example here is actually about how pattern can promote inclusivity um, and belonging. So this is a project that we did with Harriet Watt University in Scotland last summer. And uh, they wanted to have an area that sort of showed their long-standing support of the LGBTQ student community. Uh, it looks fantastic. Um, so that's just a quick run through of aesthetics, but also we need to think about product performance. And um, Ben also mentioned this. Um, sound is really, really important. You know, the, the um, a surface that can absorb sound and reduce sound transmission can only benefit in a multi-occupancy space. And similarly, we've also seen um, a real increase in people looking at floors that offer to improve slip resistance. That gives that sort of practical benefit to the occupants of the space if they don't have that, um, that concern of, of any kind of water spillage. As you can see from this image here, it doesn't need to look that sort of typically institutional safety floor look and feel. And then there's hygiene. Uh, this has obviously been, um, again, something that's always been considered, but has taken on a whole new meaning in the last couple of years. So choosing a surface finish that has an inbuilt antimicrobial or antiviral protection can just really help workers to feel more confident that they're in a space that's that they're safe to be in, whether that's a busy city centre office or a healthcare facility. Um, 
so if it's important to you it's important to us um, and it's really vital that you work with the right suppliers to help you promote that health and well-being at Amtico we've been designing and manufacturing floors for nearly 60 years so every one of our floors comes with a wealth of experience from our in-house specialists and I wanted to also just touch on the sort of sustainability element of our business because I know how important that is to understand where these products are coming from. So obviously it's not directly related to the well-being of the user, but it's vitally important in terms of responsible specification. So it's something that we've been committed to for a number of years, as well as making sure our floors achieve and exceed standards such as M1, and the indoor air quality gold, we're always looking to improve our processes and our products. So just an example would be in terms of pre-production, we have a, a sustainable supply chain, we have a customer audited ethical trading policy, and a commitment to using um, as many recycled products as possible. So um, we only put recycled glass feeding into our safety floors, and we only use a bio-based plasticizer. At our manufacturing site in Coventry, we have complete control over our raw materials, our waste and our recycling. And almost all of our production is recycled. Our waste production is recycled back into products where we can and where we can't. It's repurposed by another UK firm into products such as traffic cones and speed bumps. Um, our scope one and two carbon emissions are offset and we're working towards scope three as quickly as, as we can. Wherever possible, we aim to only work with other similarly certified suppliers. And we also offer a factory tour for anyone that would like to come and see how we do things. We love a challenge, especially if it's one of your challenges, and we'll work with you on everything from bespoke schemes and sampling solutions through to on-site, technical and aftercare whether it's a quick turnaround project or a global um, complex spec, we specialize in solutions and we pride ourselves on being more than a manufacturer. Collaboration and trust is still at the heart of everything that we do. And that's why we work so well with so many of our specifiers in the community. We want to make it as simple as possible for you to specify amazing flaws from us because there's enough to worry about when designing a scheme and surely your health and well-being is just as important too. And on that note, I'll finish. Thank you for listening today. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Yeah, can you hear me there, Sophie? Sophia, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, well, again, thank you for Amptico for being a sponsor today. Um, I mean, it's amazing to hear all the credentials um, for designing more sustainable products, which I think is, you know, in this world that we're living in, it's very important and also working towards net zero and the climate crisis. Um, I'm also loving the influence of the mood with colour and there's lots of examples that you showed. Um, I love the ability to zone off um, so those subtle ideas can create like subtle wayfinding. So do you find for new build product, uh, projects, sorry, and even retrofit, are you finding that you're getting involved earlier in the process um, with the, the, the idea of designing interiors and the exterior becoming more important at an earlier stage? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, you know, uh, what we're trying to, to do with our architects and designers is work at a very collaborative stage really early on. Um, and what we can perhaps offer them is just that support um, case studies to sort of say, look, this has worked in a recent project, what you're trying to achieve. But flooring is a fantastic way of, especially like you picked up there, um, the, the wayfinding aspect. And especially through COVID, we had a massive surge of interest in this because I don't know if you recall, but when we were in that, in the heart of the pandemic, when you walked into anywhere, first thing you did was look down at the floor because they were directing you around a store. And that hasn't really changed. Obviously, it's got a lot more subtle. Um, but with, with the return to office working and a, a much more hybrid model, uh, what we're seeing actually is that um, there's a real demand for the office workplace in particular to be 
much more than just an office space. It needs to have breakout areas. It needs to be promoting well-being. We need to entice these people back from their homes to travel into the offices. And flooring can create that, especially with the pattern. So you, we use the flooring to maybe um, create breakout areas to define what's a working area and a task area and what's a relaxation area. And then within, say, hospitality, um, patterns used a lot just to create um, a lot of um, excitement and stimulation, but also to direct you around the building. Things like just a simple thing like a pattern around a bar apron yeah. just kind of gets everybody without consciously realising to stand in a certain point beside a bar. It does actually, thinking yeah. about it now. Uh, but anyway, we, have, we do have a question from, Rain, uh, from Rowena, and I know we're, we're running like a little timer thing here. So I'm, I'm going to put this question uh, forward, but I'm going to ask Rowena to potentially contact you. Um, sure. So Rowena asks, what patterns do you offer on flooring? So in, in five seconds, what you can tell, and then I think maybe Rowena should get in touch i think we offer about 300 different patterns so she she needs to get in touch and i will talk her through that there's a lot thanks so much sophia okay. uh, for your presentation um and we're gonna of course now move on with i think we're okay in time just running a little bit like five minutes later um so our next speaker is linda moray burrows who's the principal director of Morey smith so linda good morning good morning how are you Really good, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. So you're the founder and principal director, and you established Morris Smith in 1993. Um, it's a London-based practice, a chartered uh, RIBA practice, um, that is approaching three decades of designing notable projects across the world. Um, so as one of the foremost designers in Britain, Linda has delivered bespoke workspaces for hospitality and residential projects uh, with her team and designers for a range of global clients, including which we will be speaking about today, the headquarters for CBRE, Sony Music, LVMH, Primark, Lazari, British Land, and Ashby Capital, to name a few. So Linda is a leading expert in breathing new life into heritage building, uh, buildings and is most known for bringing together the very best talent for residential, retail, and boutique hospitality design that creates uh, beautiful and comfortable spaces, spaces for people to live and thrive. Today, Linda will be presenting the excellent case study CBR Headquarters Henrietta House in London. Um, the workplace was designed in 2017 and due to the forward thinking required little change in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, I don't want to spoil what Linda has to say. So Linda, welcome. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to, to hearing more about CBRE Headquarters. Lovely, thank you very much. Okay, so we actually, oh, hold on, my slide's not moving. That's strange, oh, here we go, sorry. So we actually started the project in 2018. Um, this is how CBRE had occupied the space. They had been there for about seven years and it was very dated. Um, and you can see here, very corporate and green and the, um, the, the whole back of the building was a long rectangle, looked out over this loading bay on the top right, um, which was all very dark and um, not much light at all. And we had a great opportunity. It's very unusual. I was asked to just have a look at some options they were considering. They were thinking about whether they needed to move or whether they really wanted to stay. They love the building at the top of Bond Street and they wanted to get more lockers for everybody in the building. I know it sounds strange, but the project actually started as lockers. And I asked, is there any opportunity that we could maybe have some ideas about uh, building in this void space? And they said, well, just have a look and see what you come up with. And so very quickly, as we architects and designers do, we came up with this amazing idea, which was probably a bit more um, than everyone was expecting. Um, and almost the immediate, the initial ideas to create a form in this space, um, at the, at, although we obviously evolved and developed it, um, is, is pretty much what we built. Um, and the main, um, the sort of key to it was creating this depth over the old uh, Debenhams loading bay, which was a sort of a springboard for us to build this beautiful new building at the back take down the back of the old Henrietta house and create this beautiful new building. Um, and also creating 
outdoor spaces. They didn't have any outdoor spaces previously. Um, all their meeting rooms were in the basement. Their cafe for their staff was in the basement as well. And so we created this gorgeous uh, courtyard as well. Now, CBRE were very clever, obviously, they are leading um, global property specialists and they actually put together a very sweet deal. It was very good, uh, very fortunate for all of us that uh, Lazari, the landlord, owned the entire site. Um, so when we came up with the idea, they spoke to Lazari and very quickly um, managed to persuade them that it was a great idea to uh, appoint us. So we were commissioned not only as an architect, interior designer, we actually uh, delivered a turnkey um, from everything from the furniture, the art, the branding, the graphics. It's a very unique opportunity to create something very special. Of course, both the landlord and occupier are delighted that we managed to increase the building by 45%. So it was a win-win all round. And you can see they're nestled in the back of what was the old loading bay, this beautiful new building with the two atriums, which gave a sort of buffer around the other buildings. Early on, we, we created these sketches and once they'd got over the shock about the amazing opportunity, they started sort of thinking about what, what does it mean to them? And they loved the idea of this great big new building, um, which would be a you know, huge advertisement to their skills and what they do in the property world. And they wanted to be able to see it right in the street, which was impossible. So what we said was, as soon as you get into reception, we can create a double height space and you can get the vision up to the atrium very quickly. Now here is a, a view that not many of you will see because it's from the back of the building. It's from um, the Wigmore Street side, but looking at the whole of the new piece of architecture. So there's the, the, the atrium on the west with the, all the new staircases and vertical circulation and mobility and, and stairs and encouraging people to move around the building was really key to everything we did here. And you can see a little window into the workplace on all the levels there. And the building has transformed into this beautiful arena for light. And the way the sun moves around the building is amazing. We didn't want to leave the front door looking as it did on the right hand side, used to enter in through this rotunda. We wanted it to be like a shop front. It's at the very top of um, Bond Street. We wanted it to be everything that CBRE wanted to be, to be able to portray and convey the very best of them, to give them a frontage and a window to the world that people could look in and see what they do. But we didn't want to um, affect the actual, we didn't want to do a demolition, we wanted to retain as much as the building as possible. So we only actually took down the ground to first floor to recreate the whole of the, the, the facade at that level. Now, after this initial, of course, the architecture development and evolved all the way throughout the project, but it was a very, very quick project. We got on site um, in October 19, and we had about six months on site before the pandemic uh, kicked in. Now, the only change that we made in the pandemic was that we went from a phased refurbishment to everybody was already out, so we completely um, took on the whole project and got everybody out of the building completely. Now that gave us the opportunity to focus our attention completely throughout the whole process and the six months before the pandemic in the people, reviewing all their previous surveys, analysis, what, what everybody knows in designers and architects, focus groups, observations, online studies, really thinking about the people, their well-being, and what people would want with this lovely new space that we created. So home to almost 2,000 people, um, it's an entirely flexible solution, but people do have their own departments. So it's not people wandering around the desk, around the building, trying to find where they are. Everybody has a home, everyone knows where to go. Um, it's on course to get platinum well standard and Brienne excellent too. The ground floor, the yellow highlighted on the plans, you can see the vertical uh, stack of the building there, is very much the meet and greet. It's all about the clients, it's all about the first impressions. And when people come in and I watch them move through the building, there is a sense of awe and people can't even recognize the old building. The staircases that go down to the seminar rooms and up to the base of the atrium. You can see on those two plans, the, the top plan being the original. And previously, they'd had all the meeting rooms and offices everywhere, all lining the windows. So there was no access to natural daylight. Now we have kept, there's no offices for anybody. 
It's all entirely open plan, but with lots and lots of cellular spaces and brilliant acoustic, but all inboard so that you get the light throughout the building. And it's beautiful Fernando uh, sculpture created in porcelain uh, greets you as you come in and also takes your eye up to the base of the atrium. We've used very much natural materials, natural stones, flashes of color on anything that can be more um, changeable like furniture. The lighting is different throughout the space. We've got recycled leather, we've got horsehair panels there. Um, as you can see here, you can get a little taster of the, the art, which is very important in the building as well. Little, um, accents of colour and interest and different places people can go and travel throughout the building. You can see here now you can actually see the beautiful church because there's no offices or meeting rooms up against the windows. On the entrance area you can go through if you're a client you can go base yourself here and there's access to lovely coffees and planting and interesting lighting as you go through the space. Um, as you'll see now you're moving up the building onto the first floor this is the base, so this is the new base that we threw in across the, the whole of the, to cover up the loading bay. So now you see these beautiful glazed white bricks. There's a cafe and a terrace, there's two atriums. You can see the floor plate here, how it changes, how it was just a long, thin rectangle. It was, everybody worked in silos. It was a bit like a call center. There was offices all against the windows. And now it's very light and open. You can see happy faces of people walking through the building. We've also uh, cut an aperture in the rotunda all the way from the second to the seventh floor. And people can move through the spaces, there's staircases. This is the cafe space with the little pod meeting rooms. There's open balconies. Apart from on the second floor where there's glazing to the, the cube, it's all open. Um, the acoustics actually works really well. There's a real sense of energy when you go into the space people actually come running up to me saying they love the building, they are so happy. Um, everybody, they haven't had any problem with people coming back to work. People love working there. Whenever I'm there, it's incredibly busy. The, um, the white glazed brickwork brings in the natural daylight and the movement with the staircases. Lots of different uh, British uh, designers we've used for furniture. And here's the courtyard, which is the base of the first floor as well, which that was actually taken in December. Now it's just a mass of green and bees and birds and there's barbecues there. This is the cafe by day and by night it turns into an event space and a bar. Um, on the first floor as well, it was a part of our initial strategy to create a co-working space. So the whole of the floor, which uh, links up to the atrium, is slightly enhanced finishes and materials to encourage people to not always work in their own departments, but to come and work in a different team, about to meet people from the regions or from other global um, offices. And the meeting rooms here and everywhere are all completely open with a lovely graphic, so um, you don't walk into them, but you can have, there's visibility, there's nobody behind closed doors, it's very open. The, all of the design is created with a passion and love for detail. And here's the staircase that goes all the way through from second to seventh floor, again, very light and open. Everybody can see you as you're walking through the space. There's no hiding way. It's become a buzz of creativity and huge success for CBRE. Um, here's looking from the West Atrium, looking into the cube, as we call it, um, into the workspace. And then the floors two to six are the main workforce. And there's not any, there's nowhere that's back of house. Everywhere is very open. Clients walk around, they can work on any of the floors. This is, look at this image here on the left, is a T point that's for the, for the on floor working. Uh, and you can look out over the atrium, there's meeting rooms, there's focus rooms, there's um, family rooms, contemplation rooms. Um, there's various different settings. So, the lighting and the furniture changes wherever you are in the building. You can have choice, individuality. You can find places with quiet, places with colour, places that are calm, places with planting. Then from the ground floor then going down, there's two subfloors, which are the lower ground floor. They always had their seminar rooms here and now we've refurbished these into a lovely bright uh, client space. 
And also the cafe space that used to be in the low ground floor is now the fitness suite. So we have spinning studios, we have a gym, we have wellness rooms, we have personal training rooms. And then in the basement that used to be um, a car park, there's the, we converted the, the goods lift, the car parking lifts that used to come in from Wigmore Street, uh, Windpole Street, sorry. You now come in with your bikes in the lift down to the um, sub-basement and the whole floor is entirely given over to um, showers, lockers, bike storage facilities, very state-of-the-art, beautiful provision for cycles and you can shower here and then go back up to your to your floors. The left hand image is um, how the car park looked before. It used to be just a sea of cars and uh, just a few grotty lockers pushed to one side with a shower. Now as you come in you feel and, and I think what I've um, on speaking to people, they feel really proud to be in the building. They're so proud to bring clients in. There's a sense of happiness, of well-being. Not everybody cycles in, but actually they use this area for running, for fitness, for training. And then I've saved the best to last because this is my very favorite uh, part of the whole building is the seventh floor. So previously, um, they only really had the little rotunda, which had been a big circular boardroom, which was never really very successful. They always felt it was a very odd room. And we managed to take back um, either side of the rotunda, there was two plant spaces. So right on the front facade of, you know, looking out of a Bond Street was the housing for the plant, which we've now moved on to the top of the new building to able to reclaim back this space and um, we've created these beautiful um, spaces either side now, which link up to the new build at the back. So on the left, we've created a library. Now, why a library, you say? Well, it's for everybody. We wanted a space when we kind of run the surveys and we spoke to people, people really wanted um, a space where they could go to a so quiet contemplation. And then on the right hand side is a, is a pitch suite and uh, at the back is the hospitality. And uh, here's the hospitality suite here, which is very much a event space. Um, you actually, many people, they have parties and um, then here's the images of the library, which this is my favorite space in the building with these beautiful north lights and all the, um, the furniture that we design specifically for here. And the sun moves around this space beautifully. And it's a really lovely place to come and have a quiet moment. And that's just the summary. And this is the little space that you'll never be able to see unless you're flying past at night or from Wigmore Street. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Linda. Well, that is, I mean, an exceptional looking product, uh, project, sorry. Um, and it's interesting that the project started out as lockers. Um, that's a fantastic vision. Um, from such a small product to such a great building. And um, Jen um, said, uh, such a great project and a masterclass in upselling. Can't believe this started off just as lockers. Um, I love the fact that you had the opportunity to increase the building by 45%. Um, and I guess the change in ideas from taking something from the basement to put it into the top floor. But could you give us a little bit more on the idea of home two? I really like that, that, what you said there. Could you just kind of get, go into it a little bit further? On um, home? The home too, so where people come into work and it's their home, we probably spend more time at work, well, yeah. in the past. I mean, literally, there's, there's somebody came running up to me when I was there just last week, quite, you know, maybe young 30s, and said that I changed his life. And I honestly, I'd never even met him before. I felt almost quite tearful. And I think it's, you know, people have worked at home for such a long time and they actually were at, you know, they didn't even have the opportunity of coming in because their office was a building site as well. Um, and to be able to come back and have something that's more beautiful than your own home, as beautiful as possibly a hotel you might stay in or a shop or a cafe you might visit in, and to have the choice. now. 
you know, with 2,000 people, you could imagine there's very different types of people. There's some people who just want quiet and they want to work in an isolated location. And there's some people who love, you know, collaboration and things. So it's really being able to make sure that there's the mixture for everyone and in such an easy way so the flow of the building works so you can see you can see everybody and you can see where it is you know sometimes if you're in a space and someone says oh if you go to the fifth floor there's a breakout space or whatever but if you can see it yeah well from that idea of flow um, of course we always need to think of the real technicalities of designing buildings um, and tom adams um, he wanted to ask you this question so in terms of the atrium how does the fire strategy allow um, for the upper floors all to be fully open? Not to put you on the on the spot there, but uh, you know we have to think about fire it, quite a lot in our design. It's system. very complicated, and um, in the end, the fire solution was it was um, considered as an entire building, um, and there is a very complicated fire strategy, and there are um, some fire curtains in some situations around the staircases. And there's obviously protective fire routes with the the estate escape staircase. Um, I think that it was what a, you know. I think if anybody had thought about doing this project, it might have taken longer. I think it was the fact that it just happened. We had to solve every problem along the way, and we didn't know to start with that we were even going to take the back of Henrietta House down. At some point, we were thinking that we'd create a sort of little um, light wells and then have a new building. And then it was quite obvious as soon as we started, you know, modelling it, that actually we need to take the back down. And of course, after uh, post Grenfell, um, the fire strategies were, were very complicated. And um, I, I mean, I, I can sure I can post something wherever you say to, to, to give people more details about how we did it. I think that'd be really, really helpful for some of, of us who, well, I hope in the future get to, you know, work with clients like that with such kind of forward thinking views. I think like what you just mentioned there, the idea of it came together as a process of discussion. And it brings us to some of the conversations that Ben had earlier in terms yeah. of, you know, thought processes. It's not always the final answer. Things need to move on and everybody kind of all the stakeholders had a, a share in the thought process and the work, the people who work there. And, and, and off very lucky is that we had a single point of contact at CBRE and at Lazari. It's complicated having two clients, but having just a single point was brilliant, actually. And, and materiality, just the last one um, in terms of the materials you actually use to open up the building, because I think I, I love the value. Like the, I, you don't see it, but it's, it's it was always hidden. There's two areas where you've hidden: the, the plant at the front, which you've opened up, and the rear, which wasn't ever used, and the basement, taking everything that where people centric things happen were so hidden away um but in terms of materials that you use did you think about that what was the um you know did you go towards a, a more sustainable material for the actual build in the rear what's that made of yeah i mean the, again i can put a whole sustainability pack on on the system everything was first and foremost thinking about people and so there were some more sustainable or some more tick boxing brian things we could have done but they were detrimental to what we thought for the people and we always went for what we thought was better for well-being rather than just ticking all the boxes um, the glazed bricks were very much about the light but it, internally we used all natural materials um, so from the stones there's timber floors everywhere so there's there's no real carpet tiles except for in one area where we had an acoustic issue in the new build but the rest of it is all timber flooring and bolon again so you know that's better for our well-being and as much opening windows as possible with all the the opening to the courtyards and things as well well thank you so much linda unfortunately you know we could speak for hours on this um, no, and I'm sure okay. the audience has really enjoyed uh, your presentation but we are coming closer to our break now and um we will resolve we were supposed to resolve at 10 to 10 to see our next case study uh, by uh, morrison company but um i think we're going to have a 10 minute break and then come back uh, thank you linda and uh, you. yeah i'm gonna have to go for a walk and see this project now <laughs> oh, well, i'll take you round Brilliant. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Short 10-minute break, and uh, we will be back at 10.15. Will that be right, team RIBA? 
Brilliant. We'll see you all in about seven minutes. Thank you. Brilliant. Welcome back, everybody. I hope uh, you've got yourself a cup of tea, some biscuits, and you're sitting comfortably for our next speaker, who is Kia Regan Alexander, a director from Morrison Company. Um, so today, Kia will be speaking about the Ellsbury Health Centre and Early Years Centre in, in, in Southwark. Um, our practice is actually based just down the road, so I've been walking past this building, seeing it built within the larger master plan um, of the Ellsbury Estate, which is going on. So it's worth having a walk around to see all the buildings going up. Um, but this one is very special. Um, uh, and so Morris, at Morrison Co. Kia shares the responsibility for ongoing strategic management of the practice and attends weekly design reviews across all his projects. He has lectured on the benefits of collaborative working methods and is an advocate for the open and transparent exchange of ideas and sharing of knowledge through collective research and debate. Uh, so, Kia, over to you. Uh, Thanks, you? Christopher. Uh, it's really good to be here. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about the Ellsbury Health Centre, which is a really special project uh, for the practice. I think we are something like seven years in now, um, and we're extremely excited to see it um, being realised um, outside of the C sort of CGI world um, on site. So um, we are we're a few months from uh, completion um, still, but um, we do have a couple of pictures um, just just of uh, what's emerging on site. So we'll get to that at the end. Um, so yeah, Morrison Company. We're we're London based. We also uh, have a, have an operation in Copenhagen. Um, so I think in the, the the project is a health project, so it, it's it's very um, very relevant for this for this discussion today. And I think in terms of well being, um, you know, let's go to the fundamentals of we, we like this diagram, which is from the World, World uh, Health Organization. Um, which talks about a complete state of uh, physical, mental, and social well-being. And I think for the purposes of our project, the, the, the lens that that puts on uh, the brief for this project is um, on the mental side, I think specifically thinking about privacy and dignity uh, for users um, of the building. Um, on the social side, thinking about the local community that this building will serve and their needs and making sure that we uh, create an inclusive environment for everyone and physiological, making sure that we're designing for comfort first. I think it's particularly important for a health building, um, community health building, where people of all different um, abilities and backgrounds will be visiting. And we think about um, this building being quite special because it touches so many parts of this use uh, spectrum um, for well-being. So you know, when we think about the, this the sector of health, um, we think about this spectrum and, and Across, uh, there's two plots on the site. So uh, we have the southern plot, HTA doing the north plot. And then the, in the bottom of theirs, they have a, a library and a stay and play and a future pharmacy. And we're combining with that um, nursery in early years and um, a health center. So we touch very many parts of the spectrum in the, in the single project. And it is a very complex uh, brief that we've had to respond to. And it's been really challenging, but extremely rewarding as well. Um, so it, on place, um, this is, uh, this is the former Aylesbury estate uh, layout and it has been gradually um, transformed um, and is as in the, in the process of being transformed as Christopher said. And our plot sits right in the middle of it. Um, and I think the desire here is to create a kind of community spine um, on Thurlow Street and to concentrate the community infrastructure uses right in the middle uh, of the master plan at the heart of the master plan off this big public space so the building has to work really hard it's an extremely important strategic building for this um for this master plan and really puts health at the heart of the master plan so this is a, a i'll talk about it being kind of a complex rubik's cube of different hybrid uses um sat right in the middle of this really um, amazing site um halfway between elephant and castle and burgess park um with conservation area um large housing estate around it and um, East Street Market is a local landmark as well. So we're, we're, the brief is combining uh, a medical health center, a nursery, which is positioned at the top, a pharmacy just um, on the other side of the square and a library. So all these community uses in one place. And another job the building has to do is to frame this new public space at the heart of the master plan. So um, there is um, HTA uh, doing the North Block. Um, 
and uh, we've worked closely with Simon Bayliss on this um, in collaboration for the plots to have come forward together. And uh, there's also uh, this, this large kind of fountain and open uh, space, which I think is a really great um, precursor on the, on the wellbeing agenda for the project that, um, that this is kind of like the doormat to the project. You come in through this um, lovely open space um, and the, the health building is at the back of it. And I think I mentioned it's a complex and difficult brief. This is a 200 page design brief we received on this project. Um, Catherine Bates, who led the project uh, brilliantly from Southwark side, uh, they they produced a very thoughtful um, uh, brief for us to respond to. And you know, I I read through it um, again last week, and I think it's you know it's also uh, important still um, to the values of the project. And actually, well being is mentioned over and over again in the brief. So I think it's something that clients could think about um, if they have uh, you know if this is an important part of their um, ambitions and, and agenda um, to improve well-being for, for building users that you, you can write it into your brief you can really weave it into the fundamentals of the project from the beginning and uh, you know assess your architect's work against those things um, yeah this is a kind of the type, kind of diagram we do right at the start so we just sort of put all of the brief on the table you know what do we have to provide what how much space is needed and then we start the process of bringing it all together. And, and there are many different uses. We have very specific um, clinical spaces like phlebotomy rooms. Um, we have um, many consult exam rooms. Um, we've got community health, um, uh, speech and language therapy. Um, uh, and then at the top, we have the nursery. And then we have all of the support systems around that. So um, clean and dirty utilities, servicing, plant, et cetera. Um, so, we played with lots of different configurations and we, we sort of arrived at um, a, a diagram of four interlocking cubes that could get all of this uh, program into quite a tight volume, but not overwhelm the site. So break up the overall mass of the site. And we stacked um, the different uses. So you sort of start with the most public uh, being uh, the sort of GP and community health services um, straight off the square at ground floor. And those stretch onto the first floor as well. And then as you transition into the second floor, you get um, the work, the associated workspaces for those um, uh, GPs and community health and nurses. So um, there's a kind of transition zone there, which is sort of private to them. And then as you go right to the top, we have um, the early years nursery and they have their own play, ter play terrace and they also have their own dedicated core and entrance um, uh, from, from uh, one of the courts to the north of the building. Um, and then we've got, we do have a basement as well, um, which, which houses all of the FM plant and uh, bikes and showers and things like that. I think the other thing to say about this is this, this, this is a model we made, which was really trying to answer the problem of how do we, how do we manifest a facade onto this building with so many different uses and so many different requirements. So in particular, we've got very specific um, privacy requirements for each different room. So, you know, we need light in rooms that we can't necessarily have people seeing into them. Um, so we've had to think very carefully about um, how we weave all that together and, and produce a coherent architecture at the end. And this is very much how we work at Morrison Company. We're, we're iterative designers. We like to test things, look at them objectively, make refinements, move on to the next one. And it's, it's a sort of um, evolutionary process of design. So we, as I said, we had this idea of bringing the program of the brief into four volumes um, that would inter interlock. So we're delivering quite a lot. Um, of accommodation in this building but hopefully the building itself um, isn't overwhelming in scale and sort of fits fits nicely with the context um, stepping up and stepping down and this is this is this is how the building's positioned on the site next to that public space so we have uh, the health center entrance right on the front um, on the back of the fountain area we've got our, our nursery early years access off this lovely tree um, lined court here and um, opposite the stand play and library facilities in the north block so they have their own dedicated core and then um, on door street we have the ability to get to the, you know the substations and uh, the car parks and also more of the back of the house uh, areas and there's also this really um, clear delineation between a more domestic condition at the back of the site and a more civic condition at the front of the site and that's also expressed through a level change um, so we have a conservation area actually to this side and the, the scale of the master plan steps up um, as you move towards Thurlow Street. And what that allowed us to do is to create um, a sort of passive uh, privacy condition where 
if you're inside a consult exam room uh, on the ground floor towards the back of the site, you are lifted up from the public spaces around and you're looking down onto them, but they can't see into yours. So that's a really kind of optimal situation for a consult exam room. And then furthermore, I think wherever we've produced glazing, we thought carefully about how the, how the uh, rooms are being used behind. So if there's consultation happening, if, if someone has had to, you know, potentially undress behind a curtain or, you know, they're, they're being examined, that we make sure we preserve dignity at all times and, um, and, and also for the staff and, and workers of the building. So we, we produced this idea of um, taking, I'll talk about the facade in a bit, but taking the facade motif and actually turning it into a manifestation that's, that uh, mimics uh, the aggregates of the concrete, so as a pattern, and, and it creates sort of an extra layer. So that the building, is, the, the facade becomes a very many layered um, uh, um, veil, I suppose, to bring light into the building, but also preserve um, the privacy of, of the people inside. And so we, we, as we went from the massing models through to the um, facade models, we started we, we knew what we needed to provide on the inside of the building and we knew what requirements we had for all those spaces. And then we brought forward this, this, this uh, facade design of, of layering. Um, and, uh, you know, it's quite a, it was quite a sculptural exercise. So yes, there's, there's obviously like clear performance requirements in the windows, but we're trying to arrange things in such a way that really work from the inside, but also produce elegant proportions on the outside. And, we, we sort of turned that into um, this concept for uh, a building which was um, highly polished, warm in colour, so the tone is deliberately chosen to contrast to a lot of the buildings um, around and pro produce kind of real warmth at the heart of the master plan. And to, so it's, it's architectural precast, it's pigmented, but it also has coloured ag aggregates inside. And so you go from a smooth surface and when you erode back from that layer, the further you go into the facade, the more of the uh, natural material is revealed and, and colour. So um, it's a very rich and tactile um, facade, we hope. And I wanted to talk about this idea of design through dialogue, which we talk about with a lot of our community projects. Um, specifically important for this project, I think we did 21 four-hour engagement sessions just in stage three um, to get, take, the, take that design brief and that concept into the tender information. And, you know, we're really sitting down with the many different building users and working out exactly where they need their bins, exactly where they need um, all of their storage. And it's all codified. It's all, you know, has NDB, NDB codes. We've got um, all space planned to be, you know, extremely efficient. Um, but I think this, it's, that's a hugely important part of this type of project is designing through dialogue. Um, so going into the plan, so the ground floor, you come in off the public space here and you enter in on the corner of this block and, you know, we want to get everything out of the way. So, so hopefully there's good flow in the building. You come straight in and you have a choice. Um, you have a choice about whether you want to go and talk to someone in reception or you can choose to self-check in just here. Um, depends what you, what, you know, what, what you feel like doing. And then, um, you know, there's, there's, we're trying to make sure it's really clear what you do next. So you can see this important feature stair right at the middle of the plan. Um, you can see the lifts. Um, all of the public functions of the building are, are sort of positioned on this side. And the green line is a sort of secure line, which actually means the building can be used out of hours for alternative community uses um, and can be uh, used in that way. And then on this side, we've got, you know, the run of consult exam rooms. And I think there's a few things I want to point out. So, you know, first and foremost, you've got this public space with fountains. Um, we've got the proximity with the library. So, that, so bringing together these uses in the same place. Um, we have... I think our, our circulation diagram is really important. So there's two aspects to this. There's a, we're always not uh, trying not to provide dead end corridors. So you always have glazing at the end of them. That's really important. But also if you consider say um, a, a, an elderly user with dementia, they, there's quite a lot of distance between reception and some of these uh, rooms. The, the idea that there's always a loop back to, to sort of home, back to, back to the middle of the plan. So if you, if you do get disorientated or lost, you kind of find your way back and, you know, that, that um, we, we've had to think about being dementia friendly in terms of all of our signage um, and uh, material palettes throughout. Um, moving up through the building. So we do have a double height space in reception over that waiting area. And as you go up, there's um, you know, extended uh, uh, waiting areas. So we imagine each different part of the waiting area, waiting areas to have a different atmosphere and people to be able to choose where they want to sit while they wait for their appointment you know we probably want we're trying to congregate families and kids in this area and we imagine that um, people that need a more quiet environment would, would migrate upstairs um, as well 
and they can do that. Um, there's also a second reception upstairs. So if you go up, you know, you can't get lost. Um, that's really important. And here you can see really well that 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 diagram of always providing a window at the end and, and a loop back to home. Um, and this is uh, just in terms of uh, how the call arrangement works. So this is the um, early years call to the north, and this is the health centre call to the south. And um, also we've got um, trees as well to, to the north and actually all around the site. And we, we really, it's, we've, we've started to get inside these rooms now and it's it really great to be inside a sort of health and cl clinical environment and, and have a view to a tree. Um, they should be great rooms. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. So we go through in, on the earlier as we have this terrace um, overlooking um, the city beyond. And we started thinking about um, everything sitting on a spectrum of public to private, clinical uh, to non-clinical. And we arranged all of the spaces in the building on this spectrum. And what we found is that we could be highly bespoke um, in the public non-clinical areas and needed to be much more um, generic um, in the more um, private and clinical areas. And there's clearly a cross spectrum there and materials were chosen um, in alignment with those, um, those imperatives. So um, these, are, these are the spaces. This is the uh, reception space. Um, this is the self-checking looking into that double height space. This is the family weight area. Um, and then as you move through the building, you go from the warm sort of public areas into much more uh, clinical environments. And we wanted that to feel like a smooth transition and not a really abrupt transition. So as you get into the clinical spaces, you have these views to trees, but you know you are very much in a GP uh, health environment by this point. Um, this is a little uh, window into uh, the nursery that sits on top. And here is uh, finally um, just where we're at in terms of progress on site. So Christopher mentioned um, he's- That's, that's, that's the last thing you have seen. <laughs> <laughs> There's such great pictures that I know you had to speed up between that time. Yeah. So in reality, we could just jump in between some of those images uh, whilst we do the questions and answers. So I think, um, firstly, um, you know, the, the words that you, you used, um, uh, uh, you know, looping back to home, I thought that was really interesting, but also privacy and dignity. Of course, in healthcare buildings, it's always there's a fear you're going in there because you're ill. Um, so how do you think your process, especially through some of the diagrammatic, diagrammatic images that you presented, through yeah. your thought process how do you think that really helped to create the building that you have today um i think i think what we yeah we, we, I, if i go back to um this section i think what we're what we were trying to do is to create um a welcoming environment as a front door and and to make sure that people that when you go in there's sort of it feels like a public space and that it's not too uh, um, abrasive in terms of being in, in that hospital environment. I mean, it is a GP's practice. We don't, we have clinical imperatives and, and technical requirements, but we have, a, you know, we can also provide public space um, at the front of the building that feels very warm, um, you know, use natural materials. So we have a bit more leeway in the public areas. And so we want to tune that up in, at the front of the building welcome people in, make them feel at home. And then uh, gradually as they transition through the building into those more clinical areas where you have much more technical demands on the materiality um, in terms of infection control and, and so on, that it's a, it's, a, it's a nice gradual transition, I think. And hopefully that will help uh, people feel that it's, you know, basically calm people's anxieties. I think it is, like you say, it can be quite an anxious thing. I didn't mention it, but there's also um, an art strategy that runs through the building. So, um, you know it, that that's woven through from a sculpture in in the reception um through to display works in the corridors um you know so th there's there's also these these ideas that will weave uh, people through the building yeah well i had i had the pleasure to actually see uh, a bigger presentation at architects on stage a few months ago um and one of the things that i think you discussed was this is quite a, a sizable time project from when you started and the idea of when you started, the image that you started with is not the one you have at the end. Could you talk to us through your process? Um, because one of the questions which comes from Guillermo, who also says um, one of the favorite practices he's seen in the UK. So congrats to the, these projects that you're doing. Um, but he was, um, he was saying most practices don't pay attention materially uh, in terms of facades until the most leap at the very end of the process or the planning process. How does uh, Morrison Co. do this within their process? And it's, it's not a question that we're looking at other architects that they're doing something wrong, but 
up all different peoples look at their process in different ways so could you kind of elaborate on that yeah that's a good question i think also christopher you'll remember that at that lecture we talked about having to change the design quite dramatically um through the planning process so i didn't mention that here because i didn't have time but we we'd approached the building we'd done that kind of classic architect thing of like being very object driven and we'd created a very sort of formal piece of quite serious architecture and actually i think the client at a certain point said Do you know what i think this actually isn't right for this site it's not right for this area it doesn't feel right and you need to take a step back and what we started then to do was to experiment more with the haptic qualities of materials so we we did lots of plaster casting um we started to play with color and, and i think when you're working through the concepts of the facades you need to think about the materials you're using as well and to bring out the inherent qualities of those materials and I think particularly when you think about getting the most out of the materials we're using um, celebrating their natural qualities is you know it's it's way more sort of efficient thing to do as well because um, there's a lot there that um, you can you can you can show you just need to give it space to breathe I think so yeah I think it's we we try and do it all at the same time I would say we, it's not we don't do massing and then facades we try and do a holistic thing and, and do and, and try and think of it all as a part of the process i'm going to try and slip in one last question bins and storage you know re really there's this whole technical thing that we need to always remember that there are things that you don't want to see um and but they're so important um and i guess with the health care space um the idea that you brought in with civic and also um homely um but also that it's going to be used by others how did you put all these things together where did you hide things you know how do you uh you know where have they all gone? What have you done to them? <laughs> uh, there, there, there is, there are sort of big service zones, but they're positioned at the back of the site. So um, we, we've really trying to zone them out. And I think also I didn't get into the plan in too much detail, but there are clean and dirty utility spaces um, associated in, on each floor. So those are the places that people maintaining uh, the, the consult exam rooms may be taking away, um, disposing of um, contaminated um, material. We've, we had to think very carefully about someone taking a bucket from one room to another and that's very much part of that design through dialogue is okay what's coming out of this room and and what do we need to do with it and how far does it need to be carried and what's the what's the process of that piece of waste through the building and out um and how do we do that in such a way that doesn't disrupt um the and the security I guess, as well isn't it the security of of the building being open and closed Absolutely. and places you're allowed in and not allowed in yeah, you've got to have a really careful security brief on every room as part of that briefing process. Um, I should also say we were helped uh, by Gary Toon um, of Sonoma Toon on this project um, in terms of those kinds of technical and clinical requirements. And, you know, it, it, it's an extremely complex uh, process, all of it. Um, it's, it's very enjoyable, though. Well, it showcases like collaboration, practices yep. working together. We can all, you know, build better spaces and, you know, utilise people who know things in their spaces right that's uh that's really 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 great um thank you so much kia and um you know wonderful presentation there but of course we've got to thank again our sponsors um for today um and we have one more sponsor who's going to present his name's uh mike meekin are you there mike yes i am i thought i'd okay. leave the video to the last second <laughs> yeah now you've got everything ready and, and of course you're coming to talk to us about the fantastic Thing about fire protection um, yeah. and uh, you work for Rockwall um, which is a mineral wool product um, you've got experience spanning 28 years wow that's brilliant in you know in this in this field um, with big brands but also always working within that kind of the fire protection space um, you joined Rockwall in 2021 um, and you work with the fire protection team focusing on engaging with fire protection and fire stopping stakeholders to, co uh, to correctly specify and the idea of installation of Rockwall Fire Pro products. Um, also, such as other products such as Stonewall, um, there will be a link in our chat as usual for you to be able to go and see the products that they provide. And also Mike will be available, you know, to speak later on after this presentation um, if you wanted to speak further about the products they do. Um, you also play an important role in educating the industry, which I think should start a lot earlier, part one, part two, all need to know now about the ideas of fire, um, and sharing the latest advice and best practice. Um, your, you and your team provide a range of support services uh, to specifiers, main, main and subcontractors, 
wider influencers within the fire services as well. Um, this includes delivering of CPDs, educational sessions, uh, in-person and remote um, specifying uh, support um, presentations. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to you. And I think today you're going to be discussing um, supporting the seamless healthcare delivery of the Grange University Hospital. So I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you, Mike. Well, big thank you for that introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see the one with the uh, presentation on. And I'll press that. Hopefully you got the presentation. So uh, thanks for the introduction and um, thanks for the opportunity to present today. So yeah, um, as I said in the introduction, this is about the Grange University Hospital. And uh, really this is a story about engagement. And the earlier you can engage with us, the more we can support at the design stage. And uh, that's the key message here is that um, we want to support at the earlier stages, design through construction. And in this particular case, this hospital trust We've carried on supporting post uh, this project because there will no support with any future redevelopment work and any future projects they have. So I'm going to talk a bit about our uh, business to start with. So uh, Rockwell as a company. So um, uh, we're a company you mentioned, uh, Mineral Wool. Uh, so we're a, a stone wool uh, manufacturer, yeah, and we're in the, a leading position in this market. And you'll see from from our figures that um, our sales are. In 2019 with 2,757 million. Uh, we had a really good return on, on our invested capital. Um, but the, the things I kind of want to highlight really is not uh, how well we've done financially, but um, is our presence. You know, we're a global company in 39 countries and we have nearly 12,000 employees. But the kind of things where we have a, a, an impact, where we make a difference, is that, you know, by using our products, you, you, you'll see here on the, the figure at the bottom left corner. That we save our, our customers 77 million in energy costs because that insulation that we bring bring to the product and this 100 sdg so that's the um the un's evaluation tool for sustainable development growth and so by using rockwell products what that's basically saying is that we have a positive impact on sustainable development goals and that's that's the key message here is that our products because they're renewable and they're recyclable you know we, we help in not only offering fire safe buildings not only in thermally um, efficient buildings not only buildings with good acoustics but we're also compliant with this need to have uh, products which are good for the environment so uh, talking about our business the main area of our business is our insulation side and as i just touched on it's thermal properties its acoustic properties help us create safe energy efficient homes and um, one of the kind of key areas which uh, we're talking about today is the is the fire safety element of our product and, and you'll see the headline figure is that our product is is capable of standing temperatures above a thousand degrees c and that's because the base building block of our product is volcanic rock and it doesn't take a lot to convince people that a product made out of rock is inherently non-combustible and therefore suitable for um, fire resistance. And to give an example, when we manufacture this product, our furnace have to go to 1500, which is a far higher temperature than you would have in an average fire scenario. And combined with, with the, uh, the great fire resistance, fire performance our product, is the insulation value. And when you look at the two thirds of the energy consumption in buildings, is the heating, the cooling, the ventilation, the more you can make that building energy efficient, effectively better and that's where we help support construction in achieving all these things which are now key things in building design as, as we've looked at on some of the presentations so look about the the project itself so the Grange University Hospital um, was for the Nairing Bovin Health Board and they were looking to create a new hospital this new 350 million pound hospital with a 471 bed capacity and they were looking to combine up to 40 services on one side to support and serve 600,000 people. They basically wanted to create a modern hospital and as I say uh, this continues to be re redeveloped and there are new projects being actually designed for this project right now, this site. So for us this came with a few challenges. 
And the first one was that um, the original design was changed in mid construction and they updated the specification. And uh, within this, uh, what they were looking for in this new, in this new reversed, this new change specification was to have a minimum impact on the building footprint with the change, but they want to achieve a 0.18 uh, U value. And they want to do this by using non-combustible products for the, the, the roof areas, the flat roofs, as well as for the compartmentation for the fire stopping. Okay, so this, this did mean that uh, we had to kind of raise our game to support. So what did we do? So first and foremost, they wanted non-combustible. As I said before, the inherent properties of our product, being a stonewall product, is its fire resistance. And our products are classified as A1 non-combustible in the Eurocode classifications. And then obviously the other challenge was this was a large project. So there's a large amount of product that was required. So we were able to supply these high volumes of insulation through our, um, our supply partners and distribution. As I said before, there was a lot of design work required on this project. So we were able to support with the necessary calculations for the U values and the system design for the fire stopping. And I'm going to show a video shortly that the, the main contractor talks about some of the uh, support we gave them on the project. Okay, and um, the external facade was done by uh, Central Roofing and Tony Davis, the MD of the company, stated that once they had the green light, they needed to move fast and we were instrumental in helping them design at short notice, offering robust technical calculations that gave them the, the, the confidence in the performance of our product and that we were able to offer this non-combustible facade with only a very small increase in the footprint of the building and they felt that was a, a real achievement. So the result was that the facade became non-combustible. We only had a minimal 100 mil increase in wall depth. The, the product used was able to withstand the exposure elements during the construction phase and maintain its performance so it didn't lose its properties even though it was exposed during the construction. And they felt that this was a game changer. We gave them the support that they needed they were able to deliver this, this building, not only a safe building, but one that was comfortable for the, 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 the hospital visitors and patients and staff. I'm going to show you a brief video, which kind of highlights um, our work on the fire stopping. The Grange University Hospital in Cabran is a new built specialist critical care centre aimed at providing treatment for over 600,000 people Southeast Wales, built by main contractor Lang O'Rourke. Rockwall have been working closely in collaboration with Optimum, the fire stopping contractor, who are experienced third party certified specialists in fire stopping and passive fire protection. A typical large hospital would have between 20,000 to 40,000 fire stops, sometimes up to 100,000 combined fire stop and acoustic seals. Many of these are usually accommodated to the manufacturer's standard details. Obviously not all standard details apply and we've got a number of unique and large complex details where we have to ask for engineering judgments from Rockwell to give advice and guidance and provide bespoke details that we can then provide to our installed customer and give them something to work to and specific requirements or they look. There's been great collaboration on this project with Manor Rocks, uh, Optimum and Rockwell. Uh, we identified all the seals early, um, had a benchmark area, read all the applications before we actually got on site to start doing the installations. As a manufacturer and supplier of these product solutions, Rockwell strives to enhance the scope of application of tested products to provide solutions to meet these challenging building needs. This helps to support the golden thread of key information, which needs to be relayed through the chain of stakeholders, from the designers to fire engineers, through to the building and safety managers, and to the building owner. Yeah, so ultimately we're trying to give assurance to our clients that everything is built correctly. So we plan Based on our fire strategy um, design, we plan where all of the fire stopping is going to go, what the services are going through the fire compartment walls, and we work those in with Rockwell standard details. Ultimately, 
ultimately we can't always achieve the standard details so we're asking Rockport for their engineering judgments and they're able to provide bespoke drawings and advice as to how we use the products and we can feed that to our installer optimum to give them specific guidance as to what they've got to do and how they've got to assemble it so that we can get ultimate sign up from our plant. There are many factors which can significantly affect the fire resistance rating of a fire stopping system. Yeah, so um, as I was saying that, hopefully you can see that back into the slide. So with the products that we have used for the fire stopping, the bulk of the products would have been the, uh, the ones you see on the screen with ablative coated bat being the, the primary product would have done 90% of the openings and would have used things like the sealant, the acoustic fix and sealant as a supporting product for that, that installation. And the key thing about the products is we test them, but they must be installed to the standard details that Lango O'Rourke mentioned. So this is where we come in and we support with those standard details. And then when there's a non-standard issue on site, we'll offer engineering support and site support to work around the problems that are built in. So that's on, on the fire side. I'm just gonna quickly move through on the um, building envelope. So there were two, two products we used for the building envelope, for the facade and for the roof, our hard rock and our duo slab products. So the, the duo slab was used as a non-combustible installation for the facade. And the, the key thing about this product was it's a robust product that could deal with the, the environmental exposure during the construction phase, but also is resilient. Um, so you can actually fix fixing through it as well. So it obviously offers really good acoustic performance, thumb performance and fire performance as a product. Similarly, on the roof areas as well as um, uh, the wall, we offered our hard rock product and our um, hard rock offers you a very robust product. So it's suitable for use on areas where you're going to have pedestrian footfall or frequent maintenance, as well as offering the acoustic, thermal and insulation requirements of the project. And that concludes the presentation. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present this and invite um, any questions. Brilliant, thank you so much, Mike. Um, and I'm, I just wanted to say that was a really clear presentation. Um, and I'm sure um, we all kind of, you know, we're, we're in awe of people protecting buildings and, uh, you know, the forward thinking uh, nature of the product. Um, but what I really liked what you brought out of this conversation was the team's effort to come up yeah. with solutions for the products that you then provided. Because I think one of the things as architects, we are, we're taking a lot more responsibilities now. Um, and one of yeah. them is understanding probably existing buildings potentially that we need to put in extra buildings on top or, you know, yeah. connecting buildings together or actually the existing buildings that, that are around. So how are you helping architects in that way for not new buildings, but existing buildings potentially? And that's a really good point because new builds are a bit easier. We can influence design and we can change things on the drawing board. And we'll probably save you more money on the drawing board than you will by changing product suppliers or anything like that. But your refurb work is the real challenge because it's as built. So how we support is that my role is I'm a point of contact for you as an architect where you've got a real person you can speak to. I can come and do our education session so I can kind of inform a bit more about the topic. And that's what we're doing here today is trying to inform people. But we have a body of testing. And from that body of testing, we can offer you standard details for most solutions. But on top of that, when we have something that's, that is a challenge, we can then offer engineering judgments by me gathering the information, passing on to a fire design engineer, and then we'll use our body of evidence to create an engineering judgment, which will give you a bespoke solution where there is one available for your as built. And so we're, we're, we're seeking to engage with yourselves to offer these solutions to, as you say, work as a team. Brilliant. And that's, that's really helpful. So listen, we're going to say thank you very much, Mike, for, yeah. for your time. Um, and also for being a sponsor or the team from Rockwall yeah. for being a sponsor of today's um, PIP. So we are going to move to the next because we're, we're kind of running a little bit later than our schedule timing. I hope everybody's still here with us um, as we go to our very last um, presentation of today. Um, so I'm going to call in Paul Hutt, who is the director of Glancy Nicholas Architects. Um, so Paul is an equity director of Glancy Nicholas 
uh, architects uh, since 2007 with over 30 years of experience and works predominantly in the care sector, um, be that healthcare, residential care or social care. He heads up a team of um, talented people. Just one second, sorry, I've lost my words. <laughs> um, and of course, he's going to be presenting to us today the ADA Belfield Centre and Belper Library. And this is one of like, uh, well, uh, reading into it, it's a retrofit styled project where you've been able to kind of keep a lot of the existing structure. So I'm going to let you speak about it. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Paul Hutt. Thanks very much, Christopher. Appreciate that. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, yes, I'll, I'll talk to you today uh, a little bit about our Ada Belfield uh, project up in uh, Derbyshire in Belper, um, which is truly uh, a community focus scheme. Uh, this development actually provides uh, a high quality residential care alongside a new public library. Uh, and as you mentioned, this is actually breathing uh, new life back into a former derelict space. Um, it's an interesting balance between the contemporary new care home element and also the retained historic facade, uh, which contains the library within that building. Um, the building was finally occupied last summer. Uh, it's been six, six years in the making, so it's really been a, a, a project that has been with us in the studio for quite some time. Um, I think before we can start really talking about the building itself, we have to understand as designers a little bit about who we're designing for. Um, this particular uh, building was actually specifically designed for people that are living with dementia. Uh, dementia is obviously an umbrella term um, that actually encompasses a number of different um, uh, aspects to cognitive health. Um, and so there's certain things that we need to deal with within the building design to make people actually be able to live comfortably within the building. Um, statistics around uh, people living with dementia is on the, on the increase. Um, perhaps one of the, the most powerful um, statistics is that by uh, well, 10 years time, or well, just under 10 years time, one in 10 people will actually be living with dementia. Um, last summer, we were actually also asked by the all party uh, parliamentary group to uh, assist in their consultation and their review of, of housing for people with dementia. Uh, and we were, we were delighted to see that actually one of our other developments was, uh, was highlighted on the front cover of that, of that report. Um, Last year was also the 10th anniversary of the Happy uh, Design Principles. Uh, they're, they're a set of 10 concise strategic design criteria um, for older pe people's housing. And we, again, we were asked to consult on those principles. Um, but ultimately, I think it's really important that a lot of the buildings that we have received various accolades for um, are not sector specific awards, they are just awards for good design and I think that's really important thing to not make that distinction, good design is good design um, and, and it shouldn't be down to specific sector requirements. So I'll get on to and talk about the, uh, the development itself. Um, Belpa itself lives within, uh, sits within the Derwent Valley uh, Mills area, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and the whole area basically celebrates the history of the Derwent Valley. Um, the site itself uh, came with some great opportunities as well as constraints. Uh, located within the centre of Belpa, um, there's a wealth of quite impressive heritage assets. Um, and whilst the, the site itself doesn't contain any, or didn't contain any listed buildings. Um, the, the factory itself was a really important asset to the local community. And as such, we felt it was really important to try and retain as much of that asset as possible. Um, these are some images of uh, what we were faced with when we first went and looked around the building. Um, Belker itself has been a 
key uh, manufacturing hub within Derbyshire, uh, right the way back to the 18th century. Um, and the site itself and this building has actually housed a number of uh, important uses over the years. Uh, it, it has been a music hall, it's been a picture house, uh, it's been a, uh, a hosiery manufacturing uh, facility. It was actually used by Rolls-Royce uh, during the World War II to actually store engines. Um, but more recently, um, between 1947 and 2004, uh, it became the Thornton's Chocolate Factory. Um, unfortunately, uh, it lay empty from 2004 until in 2013, there was quite a serious fire, um, which actually put paid to a, a large proportion of the existing factory. But what we looked at were the key aspects and the key facades that actually we could reutilize as part of this development. So through the concept design stages, we looked at key influences of the site um, and identified uh, positive pedestrian and vehicular access points into the, the site. Um, it was also really important about there's some fantastic views out across the valley and we needed to be mindful of its location within this World Heritage Site of what it would look like from across the valley looking back. The original design actually contained five key as aspects to the building. Uh, there's the residential care elements, there's uh, the public facilities, there was a D1, D2 health, health centre, um, there's a retail aspect and also the obvious parking uh, and public realm elements to the, to the building. The clients instructed us to proceed with a phase one development, which was for the residential care facility and the new public library uh, with their associated external spaces. Uh, and we developed a layout that addressed the key adjacencies whilst respecting a strong public and private definition. Um, and we worked closely with Stirling University and their Dementia Services Development Centre, um, which is an internationally acknowledged research centre dedicated to improving the lives of those living with dementia. Um, we then started to actually look at the massing of the, de the, the development. Um, the proposal was really critical sitting in that UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and also this balance between the new elements of the development and the retained elements to the building. Um, the retained facade itself was predominantly uh, sits hard on, on the back of footpath, um, giving a really strong defined edge along the existing Dermot Street. And we also, also actually introduced new large glazed interventions uh, to allow the books within the library uh, to actually clearly be on show and, and make that the clear activity uh, and draw the wider community into the space. Um, these are some of our earlier early CGIs of how we were going to interpret the, the space. Uh, we utilised some of the existing um, wrought iron columns from the original factory. Um, but we did have to obviously completely re-roof this building. We used the double height space of this part of the retained factory to house the library. Um, and this just shows the, the, the defined air, dif distinct areas within the library. And then this was our initial CGI portraying that, uh, that balance of the contemporary against the retained heritage and in the foreground, the creation of this new public square. It's also really important, uh, especially with um, people living with dementia, the use of the external spaces. So we created a number of different courtyards uh, from large, uh, quite open courtyards to quite small um, and private courtyards where family could actually come and, and see their, their relatives um, in, in comfort. And then the, uh, the element of the retained factory and the facade was obviously 
um, altered quite considerably with these interventions of large glazed elements to, to allow the library to be fully on view. I'll just quickly go through a few of the, uh, the construction photographs. You can see how uh, relatively poor condition um, the whole of the, the factory was, not only the elements that had been affected by fire, um, but we worked very closely with the conservation officer and we, I, well, hopefully we've developed it sensitively um, and it's very contextual within its design solutions. Um, here you can see the interventions for the large glazed elements that we've introduced, actually providing a bit more of a contemporary twist to the, to the heritage asset itself. Um, and then also here looking at some of the residential blocks behind which adopts the same uh, material palette of the red brick, which is in contrast to the main entrance facility, um, which is actually in local natural stone. Um, the, the environmental aspects of the material palette was very important. So we used very local materials and local labor, um, very skilled local labor, um, utilizing the local Derbyshire stone. Um, we were also very fortunate to have built a working relationship with Derbyshire County Council on a number of similar projects over the last 10 years. Uh, and really, I think without uh, the passion of that client um, to make a real difference, I, I think it would have been a very different outcome. Here you can see some of the, the, uh, the courtyard areas with the meandering pathways around. Um, and this is glimpses into the residential bedrooms here on the left on, on this, uh, this particular photograph here. Um, before the actual residents moved into the facility, uh, it was used uh, for a short period of time as uh, a small nightingale ward during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, and I think some of the aspects of the design with the really wide and generous corridors actually allowed it to, to serve that purpose very well. And that in itself will now uh, protect this development moving forwards in terms of that kind of usage. Um, we did work uh, with Stirling University who have their own um, design analysis uh, and they award uh, gold, silver, bronze standards um, based on uh, a number of criteria. And it's all focused around the well-being and quality of the life of the residents. Um, this is a typical uh, ensuite bedroom. The, the bright yellow door on the right hand side is, is a key design aspect. Uh, yellow is one of the last colours in the, the colour spectrum to be lost through age. <clears throat> so that makes that differential of any yellow doors provide uh, access to toilet facilities. Um, and then drawing together the care home and the library itself has provided a real uh, community asset and our holistic approach to the design um, considered not only the environmental sustainability but also the economic and the, uh, the social sustainability of the project. Uh, this, this is an image of the, uh, the library uh, and, and as I've mentioned earlier these large glazed elements actually allowing the books to be clearly on show, uh, to, to draw the wider public in uh, and to use the facility. And then the final images, uh, photographs of the finished library uh, with all the books in place. Uh, the sympathetic uh, scheme that we've produced hopefully will now give this, this new rendition of this building uh, another hundred years life, let's, let's hope. And that's the conclusion of the, uh, the project. I think we started and ended on this same image. Uh, I think this really shows quite uh, strikingly that, that balance and that compromise that we've done between the more contemporary new aspect with its own color palette against the retained structure on the right 
and then the residential block in a more private setting beyond just taking the cues from the uh, the existing building in its materiality. Thanks so much, Paul. That was a really interesting project. I mean, one of the things that I think this resonates in this is what you mentioned at the end, a hundred more years of life uh, in a in a building that's had such a such a kind of varied history um, and the unfortunate nature of the fire, but also that opened up a kind of new space for for the community. So I, I just want to congratulate you know you on that that um, the design of it. It just it looks really really nice, and the idea of bringing the new and old together that we don't just have to kind of recreate the existing building again, but we can update it, such as the Victorian building, I guess, and, and much smaller extensions, but you can update the, the look of a building, but still keep the character there. Um, and it comes very much through. I do, I do have a, a question, I guess. Um, uh, your thoughts about the double-heighted space uh, and the library and the idea of bringing the community in, and then the home is for the dementia a residence is there a connection that helps them kind of improve their life whilst they forget things they start to remember things what, what's your thought on, on on this very much so the the initial concept of putting uh residential care specifically for people living with dementia alongside a public library uh was was quite a challenge uh for a lot of people um, they didn't necessarily feel that the two uh, functions went together. The reality is actually the complete reverse. So um, the residents uh, from the care centre uh, do come out into the public areas and do go and use the library um, with help from staff. And that generates this whole actual communication starts to happen with, with just the general public. And I think that that in itself actually helps to reduce this stigma that can be associated with uh, people living with dementia and care homes. Um, that, that thankfully now I think long gone feeling that people should be sort of hidden away. Um, this, this completely flies in the face of that and puts it front and centre and actually really helps with the residents themselves and uh, there, there have been a number of instances where residents have regained certain skills that they had lost very simple things um, purely by the built environment has allowed them to regain some of those skills which i think is great it, it, it's a great thing to happen so so just Further on to that, uh, because at the beginning of the presentation, you discussed about the pedestrian walks in and the transportation. And I guess, of course, with 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 the, the the kind of people that are being dealt with in this area would probably have to come in in cars or other types of transport. How were you able to merge the two so you had a safe method of the kind of not really, you know, we can't get rid of the car, can we? We can't get rid of the, uh, you know, forms of transport, but we need to kind of make them work together. Could you kind of elaborate? your process of thinking of those two things potentially marrying together on the same space so that it became a safe kind of area to be able to walk and do other things. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You, you, we, we can't get rid of the car altogether. Um, so what we've actually done here by creating this new public square that you're looking at in the foreground, uh, this leads all the way up to the building frontage and either side of this just out of shot of the photograph, there's actually two defined parking areas. To the right hand side by the library which is which is the closest to the main entrance uh, is where there's disabled parking and then on the on the left hand side as you look at this is the wider car park where staff will park and relatives of residents will come and park but then there's this real uh, buffer between those those two elements of the public square the public square actually uh, has also become um, an area that the uh, the local community use, um, which which is really a great thing to happen. Um, the, the the youth of the area actually use it. They they congregate there. They they'll skateboard there. Thankfully, that doesn't come with any associated antisocial behaviour. But um, again, it just allows people to oversee that that usage of the space and as soon as people start to use the space they actually take some pride and ownership in the space 
Yeah, de definitely agree. I guess we have to ask a couple of technical questions, and this is coming from our audience. Um, I'll try and mix the two because of, co of course of time. Um, but we've got a question from Patricia Salas and Sadika. Uh, I'm going to mix the two, but one asks about um, is public furniture and public buildings regulated, which I guess, of course, in terms of that kind of fire idea, we need to have a uh, have a thought about that. And the second question, um, how have you been able to kind of hide all the uh, m and &E services um, in the building fabric without them being exposed externally? Um, <laughs> I'll deal with that, that, that second question first, if I may. Um, it takes a lot of coordination and a lot of, shall I say, um, discussion uh, in the early concept stages um, to ensure that that is hidden. Um, all too often, uh, services can drive spaces and uh, it's almost a path of least resistance. So you would do actually have to challenge everything and you do have to work very collaborative with collaboratively with the other consultants to just go that little bit extra mile and, and let's let's have some beautiful spaces that don't have dropped bulkhead ceilings and, and what you, you see only too often. So it's through that that careful coordination, I think, is the, is the real answer to that. And then the, the first question around the, uh, the public side and the furniture, I think was the question uh, and, and legislation. Yes, absolutely. There, there is that legislation, uh, certainly from a fire aspect. Uh, with this particular type of uh, usage as well, there are specific user needs to furniture. So uh, you will have seen in, in the, uh, the lounge areas, there was a very mixed uh, array of different chairs because there's not one size fits all so uh, chairs typically are, are a little higher than we would be uh, ordinarily using um, some of them are on runners so that they can easily be pushed in and out from tables uh, and also some people like to sit on a sofa some people like to sit on an individual chair so there is that mix of chairs used in those those areas as well Brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. I think I'm going to have to thank you. Um, we've had lots of questions and this is for all the speakers and, of course, um, our sponsors. But I think a thread that goes through all these buildings is, you know, that we should be like public spaces wise, speaking to our clients, but also looking at what our, you know, our, our users need um, and, you know, early engagement with those ideas are going to be very, very important to create much more well-being and healthy spaces. That's outdoor, indoor connections to other people working together as architects. So I would like to take this opportunity again to thank our sponsors, Amptico, um, and who are flooring specialists, Rockwall, who are fire uh, prevention specialists. Um, the webinar today has been recorded and will be made available as a webinar um, by the RIBA. I want to thank RIBA for asking me to present today and I hope that I've been a, big, a good chair. Uh, I'd like to remind you, of course, Ben, who spoke at the beginning, he has his book available and there's a 20% discount on this book at the RIBA bookshop, but there's also probably lots of other great books that you can go through. So do go to the bookshop and have a look. It's now available online. Um, and yeah, just thank you for coming. Um, and I believe the next PIP webinar uh, will be Architecture and Design for Sustainability, which will run really well after this one. So that's in, on the 20th of September. Um, I'd like to say thank you again for everyone. There's people in the background who you don't see who are helping us to make sure this runs smoothly. So thank you for the technical team, RIBA, all our um, esteemed audience from all over the world and our speakers. Have a great day.